morning again, and it's good to see you here. Um, I am very excited uh, to be here again. To, to be in Paris is fantastic. Uh, to be in this place is amazing. And to be able to talk about uh, uh, APIs and the future of APIs is also very exciting to me. Um, so I have a talk I hope um, will be of some interest. It's, it's a little bit different than what I normally do. So if I'm a bit nervous, please bear with me. But I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to talk about this uh, today. So the name of my talk is Telephones, Mechanical Turks, and the Future of APIs. You only know this word, Mechanical Turk, right? I think we may have heard this before. We'll talk a little bit about it. But actually, I want to talk about the future. And that's really what this talk is about. This talk is about the future, our future, the future that we create. And APIs are just one part of that future, but that's what we'll focus on today. Um, most people are very excited, very positive about the, the future of APIs and the API economy and the things that we can do. And I am too. Um, I've actually been working in this space a long time, and uh, I want my jetpack. I want the promises uh, that, that I had when I was a child in the space age, right? This, by now, I suppose, I'm supposed to be flying to work and, and going to the moon on the weekends, right? We have these futures that we grow up with or that we think about. And my future when I was growing up was really about space, right? So uh, I had all these ideas, and many things I did were sort of geared toward how I can get to that future. So I'm, I'm very positive, but I have to also tell you that I'm a bit not just disappointed, but a bit worried. Because many of the things that we talk about and that we do today, all the sort of amazing things that we have available to us, really, um, most of them seem to have come before us. All these amazing things that we have every day that are all over. And I think we take advantage of them quite a bit. In our business alone, in our space alone, there are so many people that came before us that had so much courage and that have done so many amazing things. The first programmer, Lady Lovelace, the first telegraph systems, uh, telephones, Turing, Claude Shannon and information systems, Douglas Engelbart inventing the mouse, the pointing device, all these things have happened, most of them, more than a decade often generations, some of them more than 100 years ago. So I, I'm worried that I don't always see the same kinds of amazing courage. These are not just people inventing services, right? These are people inventing real life things that change the world. So in some ways, I'm a little concerned that we're sort of squandering our future, we're actually taking all the, the things that, that we're standing on the, on the shoulders of giants and we're taking all those things and using them for our profit, but I'm not so sure that we're thinking about 100 years from now. What are we doing today that will affect the world 100 years from now? And that's what I want to talk about because that's the future we should be striving for. That's the work I think we should be doing today. Now, um, there's a great quote that talks about the future by uh, George Santayana. Who, he wrote this quote while he was teaching at Harvard. And he had some amazing students while he was at Harvard. T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, Eleanor Roosevelt, W.E. Du Bois. These people also shaped our present, right, because of their future. So this is a great quote, and this quote uh, also even appears at the uh, Auschwitz Memorial in uh, from World War II, those who cannot remember the past. But there's another quote that I want to uh, highlight today, and it's not as well known, but I think it's incredibly powerful by an engineer uh, in, in, the, in the United States. Those who ignore the mistakes of the future are bound to make them. What are the mistakes of the future that we are ignoring today? And, and, and how do we even go about dealing with that? Are we thinking about the future in ways that give us the power to, to uh, not make the mistakes that are before us? That's the challenge that I want to put today. 
Because if we can do that, if we can skip over the mistakes that are set before us that are li we're likely to make, we can sort of go ahead of the class. We can skip a grade. We can go farther sooner and faster. And we can avoid pain and we can avoid problems. But if we wait for the future to come to us, there's no telling what will happen. So what I want to do is I want to tell two stories first. And, and these stories relate. And I will go back into the past to talk about these stories, because I think these are very important. The first one is Alexander Graham Bell and his telephone. So in the early 1900s, really in 1880, he creates this, uh, he finally builds the telephone he'd been working on for so long. And it's a fantastic device. Um, one of his peers, the President of the United States at the time, after seeing the telephone, remarks, who would ever want to use one? Right? Was he thinking about the future? But it turns out lots of people would want to use it. It took some time, but the first people to use the telephone were the newspaper business, was the, was the current information age. This disruptor actually improved their business. They saw it as a way to make information travel faster and farther for less. And Soon after that, businesses began to pick this up. They didn't at first, but once they realized information moved quickly, they realized they could reach larger markets and they could make decisions earlier, they could use it to make profit, right? And eventually, we even get telephones in homes, right? So now families can move further apart and still seem close. We have new connections, new ways to build communities. But the most important and powerful aspect of this is sort of a secondary feature. And that is the notion of a network. Now they're networked together in an incredibly powerful way. Now, it's really interesting. I, I, I tried to come up with some early numbers on the telephone. It was te technically introduced in 1890. There were, there were a few hundred in 1890. There were about five or 10,000 in 1895. There were 50,000 in 1900, and there were six million 10 years later. Right? So it did take some time. But once it took off, once the network started, it was unstoppable. And of course, it goes on from there. That's just the first 10 years. So this notion of these, of these telephones altered our society, altered uh, our world. And in fact, um, it wasn't the first time we'd had a network, right? So we had this train network in the early 1800s. We had the telegraph network in the late uh, half of the 1800s. It was really the telephone that really leapfrogged over most of these because it was so instantaneous and it was so intimate. So much so that this quote was, was uh, written about the telephone. Instant communication and, and the idea of a nervous system written in Scientific America in 1880. So it's almost like that quote could be about our internet, right? but it was about the telephone more than 100 years ago, almost 150 years ago. But there's a secret in this story. The telephone network worked because of people, because of humans behind the scenes plugging each connection together, right? You said, I want to talk to so-and-so, and somebody plugged you in. Even well into the 40s, in 1940s and 1950s, especially with overseas calls, you needed a human to complete the call. Uh, interesting side note, um, this is a picture that we normally associate with telephone operators. Tele the original telephone operators were not women. They were young boys. They were boys who used to work in the telegraph offices. They were the ones doing the initial connections. However, they were problematic. Uh, they were boys. They were, they were a little unpredictable. They would get into fights. They would drink. So a person in um, the home, my home city of Cincinnati uh, decided to, get, to fire all the boys and hire all the women because they were more dependable. Actually, they were cheaper, right? And they would do what they were told. And they were dependable, right? So our telephone system, everything we built on, is this notion of people actually doing the real work behind the scenes. So uh, even into the, uh, the early parts of computers, this idea of people behind the machines was very, very important. Um, this is a picture of the very first 
a computer network that the US military put together. It's called SAGE, or the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment Network. It linked all the radar systems in the world together uh, in the early 1950s. In the 1960s, we had another system that was called the Semi-Automatic um, uh, Environment for Business Research, SABER. Right? We still have the Sabre network today that, use, that we use, right? Why is semi-automatic in those names? In the early going, there was this real recognition that there were humans that actually made this work, that these machines were not working on their own. And that's very important for us to think about in our future of APIs. How many people are making these machines work? All right, I want to stop and I want to tell another story. And this story does relate to this notion about people behind the scenes. But in order to do that, I need to go back even further than 1880. I'm going to go back to 1770, the last part of the 18th century. And I'm going to go back to the Habsburg Empire in Austria. This is uh, Maria Theresa, who was the uh, actual monarch at the time when being a female was not a good thing in, in monarchies. Actually, her husband, um, uh, I think it was Francis I, and uh, eventually her son, one of her sons, Leopold II, were uh, the uh, nominal um, uh, leaders, but it was her that really ran things for 40 years. And you may not know much about her, may not, but you might recognize one of her daughters, Maria Antonia, who married a French suitor and changed her name to Marie Antoinette. And of course, we know Marie Antoinette because she's associated with a meme, this notion, let them eat cake. It turns out it's not really a phrase she ever really uttered. It's just a, a fiction, but it's something that we, we live today. So these ideas of memes, these powerful ideas that we repeat over and over, they're also hundreds of years old as well, right? We think we invented oh. memes, right? But we really didn't. Anyway. <clears throat> Maria Theresa, towards the end of her reign, entertained lots of people in court in, in Schönbrunn Palace. And uh, one of them was this, uh, the, in, at one event, there was this gentleman by the name of von Kempelen, uh, who was a great inventor. And um, he was there at, watching a magic uh, uh, program, a magic show. And he was quite appalled by this magician that used simple magnets to kind of amaze everyone in the room. So von Kempelen actually said, I will come back in six months with an incredible illusion that no one will be able to refute. It will actually be magic. And again, he's a very, this is a very smart man. He had in, built fountains uh, in, in the Austrian uh, empire. He had actually invented, at one point he invented a sort of a typewriter device, an early form of typewriter device. So he was a very, very smart man. This is in 18, uh, 1770. So he comes back six months later uh, here's a picture of uh, von Kempelen. He comes back six months later with this huge apparatus that looks like this. It's a huge cabinet with a life-size mannequin behind it, dressed in Turkish garb, with a chess uh, board on top. And he says, this is my automaton chess player. It will play chess with any human and win every time. And it was like amazing. And it was this huge cabinet. It was, it was very, very large. It took quite a while to set up. And it had these gears inside, and he would show the gears, and he would show the drawers. There was this little box off to the side. He would open up and look inside the box during any performance and sort of check and maybe stick his hands in every now and then. No one could figure this out. But sure enough, um, anyone in the court was, was invited to play, and this machine would win every single time. Even if you tried to cheat this machine, the machine would just lend then uh, ruin the board because if you did an illegal move. And it amazed people. People were incredible. Now, there's a real, first of all, I was really impressed with this because here's von Kempelen as, as a real showman. Um, at this time, von Kempelen uh, is well aware, if I can, yes, is well aware of the fact that the Ottoman Empire is at war with the Habsburgs over and over, decade and decade. So what does he do? He dresses up his magic trick as if, it's an Ottoman Turk, right? So that the Austrians, they think so ill of, of the Turks at this time, it would be so easy to think it would be easy to beat this little machine, right? But it's all just for show. So I was, I was really impressed. I was really amazed at that. So we, we have this machine, and, and over and over again, uh, it wins. All in this one day, it's this fantastic performance. So then 
After this day is over, and after everyone has had a chance to play, Von Kempelen takes the machine, disassembles it, and puts it away for one performance, one performance only, puts it away. And he refuses to, to, to uh, take it out again. So people are very suspicious. Ten years later, after Von Kempelen's already working on other projects, uh, Leopold II orders him to reassemble the machine so that he can impress a visiting dignitary in Vienna, and then orders him to take the machine on a tour of Europe. Now think about a tour of Europe in, this was in 1780. Uh, this was an arduous and grueling task. It took out quite a bit to, to drag this around, but that's exactly what he did. And um, we had all sorts of people. Uh, the Duke of Russia played this machine. Even Benjamin Franklin from the US, he was the uh, ambassador here in Paris, played the machine while he was here in Paris and lost. And it traveled all over uh, Europe through these next 10 years. London and Dresden and Leipzig and Amsterdam. Finally, after more than 10 years, Von Kempelen was given permission to come home. So he comes home towards the end of the century, takes the machine down, disassembles it, puts it away, and that's where it sat uh, until his death in 1804. And no one ever figured out how it worked. For almost 30 years, he traveled with the machine and no one figured out how it worked. Of course, now we know there was actually a person inside the machine it wasn't a hollow machine. This, the, the perspective's a little off on this, but this drawing gives you the right idea. There was, there was a, a viewport. There was a way to work the arms of the machine. So he had chess masters inside the machine playing every time. It was really quite amazing. Now, this machine sat for quite a while until it was sold, and it was sold several times. And over the next 50 years, this machine continued to travel quite a bit in the United States, actually. Napoleon I played it here in Russia and was so impressed that it could beat him at chess. I think actually one time it was a draw. Um, uh, it was also Catherine the Great uh, was entertained by it. And again, all sorts of uh, travel all over the world uh, over the next several years, um, including New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Washington, even Havana, Cuba. And finally, when it was last uh, put together uh, and sent, sent back to Havana, Cuba, the, the last owner died on the way. Actually, the last owner died on the way to Havana, left the machine in the United States, in Philadelphia, and in a fire, it burned up. So, the, so it, it uh, disappeared. But while the, the machine was in Philadelphia, Edgar Allan Poe saw it and wrote a story about it and talked about Maisel's chess player, because Maisel was the owner at that time. And in fact, lots of articles and lots of books were written about it. Um, there was even a book that was written uh, that actually talked about von Kempelen himself and his life and talked about his speaking machine. This is a machine where you could actually have a sort of a keyboard, you could push certain levers down and it would speak more than one language. It was really quite impressive. And it was rebuilt in the, the mid 18, early 1800s uh, and, and uh, written about by a, guy, a person by the name of Wheatstone, Wheatstone was also an inventor. He invented the concertina that we know about and was even inventing telegraph machines in the second half of the 1800s. Now what's amazing is Wheatstone's story about the speaking machine attracted an American inventor. Does anyone want to guess who that was? It was Alexander Graham Bell. Reading about the speaking machine gave him ideas about the phonograph and the telephone. So, why did I spend so much time, especially on this Turk? Because everyone ignored what could possibly be inside the machine. Like the logical conclusion was that it would be a human, right? But it, we love that magic so much. There is another aspect of Bell's story which I find really incredible. Originally, when Bell uh, created the, the telephone, he was told to sell telephones in pairs, right? You sell the receiver and you sell the other receiver, and people can talk to each other. And he said, no, 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 no. We're going to sell them one at a time. And that made no sense. Uh, if we had sold them in pairs, we would buy, every time we wanted to talk to someone, we would have to go ahead and, and get another phone on our desk. We would have all these phones on our desk. Oh, this is the phone for Mike, and this is the phone for Mary, and this is the, the phone for Anne, right? And that seems silly to us, doesn't it? This idea of having a single phone for every conversation. But in fact, this is exactly what we do with web services, isn't it? We have a single 
a publisher and a single consumer. Every time I want to publish something, I have to get another app, another phone, another receiver in order to talk to each service. We've ignored what we could already learn from Alexander Graham Bell. If we did this, our desk, our desk at work would look like this, right? Actually, our desk at work might look like this, but in reality, yes, it looks like this. All those telephone receivers that we carry around with us and that we install over and over and over again, right? Now, truth be told, we have solved this problem before, right? We solved this problem for documents, right? So this idea of this browser, this single agent that could talk to any document that we could communicate for any kind of content has been improved over the last 15 years, close to 20 years. But we're not in the document age anymore, are we? And again, we've forgotten what we've learned in the last 20 years. I wish I knew what the new device would look like. Let's talk about that new device. Let's talk about what that future would be like. So instead of trying to create a phone, and then every time we have a new feature, add more buttons to the phone, right, which is what we do, instead of installing the same phone over and over again when we're told that there's an update, which is what we do, we need something better. In fact, all of those things, creating all those phones, installing all those phones, packaging up all those phones, and shipping all those phones around is just one more mechanical Turk. Our magic, our little handheld devices, work because thousands of humans prop them up. Right? So how many more humans do we need to get how many more APIs working? And when those APIs change, how many more humans will we need to keep them running over and over again? Because in reality, the new operators are the programmers. Every time something changes, I say, oh, I'll get a programmer to fix that. We'll write, a new, we'll write a new version and we'll ship it. And we have all sorts, of, all sorts of infrastructure and industry to keep those programmers busy. By the way, the, the picture on the top is from the uh, first Tron movie, in which was part of the message in that movie was all of these programmers that were in their little cubicles over and over working for the big man, right? We love magic. We love that illusion of the mechanical Turk. And we love the illusion that my phone is magical in some way and that there aren't thousands of people that have to prop it up. And we love the illusion that it's all free, right? But we've dealt with this before. We have lots and lots of really amazing things around us, right? Whether it's Google Glass or 3D printing or touch screens, all these things. We love these devices, but they come at a cost, and they come at a cost today because there isn't a lot of automation in our system. And this is the future I want to talk about. This is why I'm worried, because there isn't enough automation in our system. Think about telephones. The telephone was introduced really in, in the U.S. in like the 19... In the 1880s, 1890s, became really popular by 1910. By the early 20s, we had automatic switching. It was, it was actually relays at first, then it was uh, electrical. Uh, it, was, it was not manual, but electrical. And then finally, it was digital, right? So the, we got to the digital service. It was almost 100 years, but our first switches were in just over 50 years. That's a little over two generations, two generations. Think about the automotive industry. I'm just going to pick one more. Two gentlemen, Elger, Elger Barger and I, I apologize, I don't know the other gentleman's name, invented the thing called the Unimate, this one arm, that would actually uh, work uh, on cars. This was in the 1950s. So the first plant was introduced in uh, 1913. So by the 1950s, again, all about two generations, we have automation. And this is how we build cars now. Right? So these... These technologies solve this problem. Let's look at our own world, right? The idea of browsers. It was in 1993 that CERN released the web for us for free. 1993, 20 years, right? Now, 20 years, shouldn't, how far along should we be? 
Is, is, is our 20 years the same? People say, you know, the internet, uh, there should be uh, like internet years, somewhere ev estimate between, you know, four and seven internet years to a human year. If that's true, we're on our fourth or fifth generation and we still haven't automated our APIs. We still need all those operators. But even if we don't take that rule, even if we just say it's going to be two generations, do we want to wait until 2033 to automate the web? We want to keep all these uh, people keeping things back, flipping switches, connecting for the next 20 years? I don't think so. In fact, I'm a little worried if we want to scale the web to this huge degree, we can't do it on the backs of individuals, of peoples. We have to automate. We have to actually automate the connections between applications. If we don't do that, we could end up with this world where there's just thousands and thousands of these programmers, right? H.G. Wells had an idea of what would happen if you took all of the people who are inside the Turk and the Turk itself, all the machines, and you put them underground, right? So we had this vision of, of what, uh, this sort of dystopic vision of what the future could look like when you had two kinds of societies. Now, I don't think we're headed that way, but I, I think it's important for us. H.G. Wells it was another person at the turn of our century that was willing to look 100 years, 200 years, 300 years hence and think about what we're doing today and what that might become. So again, to think about these two quotes, those who cannot remember the past and those who ignore the mistakes of the future. I want us to focus on the future, and I want to focus, we don't ignore mistakes. So what can we do? Here's some simple things. The lesson from the Unimate. Do one thing, and do one thing really, really well. This didn't play chess, right? This didn't speak. It just did one thing over and over again. This becomes the watchword of Douglas McElroy when he builds um, the uh, Unix system. Write programs that do one thing and do it well, right? And then that phone, right? That phone that has all those things on it, we, we need small devices that work together. We don't need things that are broken apart. Again, Douglas McElroy, write programs that work together. Write programs that work together. We need to stop trying to stuff more and more things inside the Mechanical Turk. We need to start taking people out and we need to start treating those devices as fully automated. We need to automate our APIs. We need to build clients and servers that work today and will work with new programs 20 years from now that we have not even seen yet. That's the way the browser works, right? We're doing things with the browser 20 years later that were never conceived, but it works. We need to stop treating services like islands, like little islands all on their own that can't even see each other. We have to realize that we're all in the same boat. We're all doing the same thing. We have to interoperate and cooperate and work together. And we have to do this in a way that we can assemble pieces to create our own apps. It should be possible for users to do this. We shouldn't need these priests that do programming. This idea is already becoming real in hardware. This is a, this is a prototype for a phone where you decide what pieces you want. I can swap out uh, less storage for more battery. I can change my processor. I can change my camera. This is really a phone that's assemblable, right, with different pieces. All right, so first of all, I've started a, a GitHub called Telephones, Turks, and APIs, so we can talk about this. And I've also started a, user, uh, a, a Google group as well. And I'll share this, uh, this slide deck in, in that space as well, as well as the script for this talk. I'd like to start talking about how we can start to interoperate together. We don't have to solve the world's problems today. We don't have to solve the problems today, but we do need to think about the future and start talking about it. So we can all get jetpacks, right? So we can all have this, this bright future. So we can all get ahead of the class and take everyone along with us. So if we use Miller's phrase that we, we don't ignore the mistakes of the future, if we focus on that future, I think our future could be very bright, very powerful, and very big. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much.